do we have a body in hell or are we just a spirit? I think people think that, that we're just, we're going to be a spirit floating in fire. Um, go into detail a little bit on that. Well, you know, I, I don't know if my body was any different than theirs because I was there in a vision. So I can't say 100%, but the rich man in hell had a body. He had a tongue. He was thirsty and he had a mouth to speak. He had eyes he lifted. So it, if it is spiritual, a spirit body, then it's similar to a physical body in that it thirsted and so forth. Uh, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, art thou become weak as we? They spoke and they could experience weakness. And, uh, and Ezekiel 32, 21 says, the strong among the mighty shall speak out of the midst of hell so they can speak. And it says they bear their shame so they can, it's, it's a, somehow they can bear shame and, and so forth. So I, it's a spirit body most likely right now, uh, but it, it resembles a physical body. And then you talk about in your in your book even in more detail than some of the stuff you even said tonight about when you were being tortured in hell was it something i'm trying to remember because i've read your book so many times but your body was almost like regenerating like you were being tortured and torn open and then it was almost like you're still alive somehow and you're thinking in your head when you're being tortured and thrown against the wall and i think you said they had torn you open from your chest the demons did with their claws that you thought how am i still alive but then it was almost like your body was just able to be tormented more that's what it seemed like to me i can't explain that i can just tell you that's what it was like it was seemed like it seemed to reform and was and could be tormented again the same way and and again just one more scripture about the body matthew 10 28 says fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell wow, wow. so uh, it is a body of some kind um but anyway yeah it seemed to regenerate and be able to experience these torments Here's a, here's a good one. Why aren't the demons in hell tor themselves in torment? Well, they're probably in partial torment, but you know, there's a scripture in Matthew 8, 29, where Jesus went to cast out a devil and the devil said, have you come to torment me before the time? So he was indicating that they're not in full torment yet before the time. What time was he talking about? Revelation 20, 10, when Satan and his demons are cast into the lake of fire, uh, burning with fire and brimstone. So that's at judgment day when Satan and his demons are thrown into the lake of fire. So at that time, they'll probably be in full torment. But right now, Matthew Henry's commentary and some others point out that they're most likely in partial torment right now because that demon indicated we're not, have you come to torment us before the time? That wow. indicates they're not being fully tormented right now. So that's that's all that the scripture doesn't reveal any more than that. Wow. And you are, man, you, I know you've heard this. I know you're like, probably don't like when I say this, but you're a walking Bible. I mean, you have the scripture just so knowing, I mean, it's just scripture after scripture after scripture. It's very, very impressive. And, and it's powerful because it validates your story. I know that would be, maybe some people have a hard time believing it, but then you give this verse after verse after verse. And I know a lot of people in the chat are like, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. I mean, you're giving a verse for everything. So it really does just reaffirm, you know, the testimony It's just, Awesome. Yeah. I commend you on that. It's incredible. I love the word, you know, that's what's important for people to believe. And I just want to clarify one thing I kind of, I, I skipped over because I was trying to not give so many scripture, but this is an important thing about why again, hell's so horrible. And I, I explained that, you know, hell's, God removed his goodness or his attributes. You know, hell is dark because first John 1, 5 said, God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said, God is life. There's only hatred in hell because first John 4, 16 said, God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says, the mercy of the Lord's in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said, it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says he is the Prince of Peace. So see, if God removes himself from this situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. Wow. Now, other than one thing, the, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. So all through the scripture, it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. It's your choice. Wow, so good. Here, here's one that kind of ties into that. Is the fire in hell literal? And I had someone messaging me this today. It's not literal fire, it's metaphorical. So I just thought it would be a good question to ask. Is it literal fire or is it a metaphorical type um, fire in hell? Now, I, I believe it's literal fire. Um, they know in Revelation 9, when it, the bottomless pit is opened, uh, it says there arose a great smoke and our air and sky were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. 
Now it had to be real fire to produce real smoke to darken our sky. It couldn't have been metaphorical smoke that wouldn't have darkened our sky. And it says that was the bottomless pit that was open down in the earth. So that shows it was real smoke. It had to come from a real fire. And then Matthew 13 talks about the tares and the wheat and so forth being separated and the angels and all the figures in there about the reapers, the angels, the, the world, the Satan's people and God's people. They're all literal figures. And then it says, it talks about the fire. So why would the fire suddenly be metaphorical and all the other figures in that uh, parable be metaphorical? No, it, it's real. It's real little fire. Like I said, there's so many scriptures about the fire of hell. I mean, there's literally uh, uh, probably about 50 verses about the fires of hell. Jesus mentioned 17 of them, 17 verses. He talked about the fires of hell. Just in John 15, 6, he said, if you abide not in me, just as men gather branches that are withered, they are thrown into the fire and burned. So he compared men gathering branches that throw into the real fire on earth. So as we, for the, those that don't abide in him, they'll be thrown into the fire and burn. So that's very clear. He used the same thing. Uh, so that, that to me is very clear that it's literal fire. Wow. Here's, here's one, Bill. Bill, how does 70 years of sin deserve an entire eternity in hell? It doesn't seem fair. It's a good question. Well, first of all, time is the wrong premise. See, we're equating the crime with the punishment, like it doesn't seem fair. But see, time, then if you say you spent three, 500 years in hell and said, I paid for my sin, that's enough time. Wow. That would be works. And it says we're saved by grace, not by works, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So that's the time is the wrong premise. And also our time is not valuable enough to pay for sins. Wow. Only the shed blood of Jesus can pay for sins, Hebrews 9, 22 says. So... It, our time, that's the whole wrong concept, thinking that you paid for your sins. And also we have to realize who we're sinning against. Mm. See, um, people don't realize who we're sinning against. And Thomas Aquinas said this, he was considered the greatest theologian of the medieval church. And he said, the higher the person the one sinned against, the graver the sin. In other words, if I lie to you, it'd be wrong. But if I lie to the Supreme Court, that would be worse because of their wow. position. And if I punch my brother in the stomach, that would be wrong. But if I punch my mother in the stomach, that'd be worse because of her position. Well, God is infinitely greater in position, but he's also infinitely greater in being. If I step on a bug and kill it, no big deal, even though it's life. But if I kill a dog or a cat, that would be worse, deserving of some kind of punishment, especially if it's your pet. But if I kill a human being, that'd be far worse, deserving of a much greater punishment. Well, God is infinitely greater also in being. So therefore, we've sinned against a holy, omnipotent, perfect, eternal, almighty God. So therefore, our sin against him is deserving of eternal punishment. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Such a good explanation. Man, these are all so, so good. And here's here's another one that God asked maybe 10 or 15 times. Is there seven levels like in the book, like in the book Dante's Inferno? And is there different? And then a bunch of people are asking, is there different levels? Is there worse parts of hell? Um, maybe talk about that. You know, I don't know if there's seven levels like Dante's Inferno. Uh, the scripture doesn't say that. It just says there are levels and degrees of punishment. Matthew 23, 14, Jesus said, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser. Matthew 10, 15, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. It infers a less tolerable. Hebrews 10, 28, of how much worse of a punishment. Luke 12, 47, you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. And Psalms 86, 13 says, uh, God has delivered me from the lowest hell. So there's different levels of hell, but I don't know how many, but the point is there are worse levels than others and more uh, severe degrees of punishment in hell. But wow. any one of them, any one is far worse than you would ever want to endure. Wow. And this one got asked a lot. I'm sure you've gotten this so many times. And, you know, I guess you can go from your vision that you had. Did you see while you, this is the one they were asking, did you see um, children in hell during your vision? No, no, I had the understanding there were none. The screams okay. and cries I heard were adult sounding screams. You know, you can tell the difference mm, of a child. Yeah, and it, yeah. Also, the, uh, the skeletons I saw, the people, they look like adult sized skeletons. Mm. But more importantly, the scripture says, Jesus said, uh, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. And uh, there's a whole bunch of scriptures like that. He said, unless you accept heaven as a little child, you'll not enter in. So that indicates little children will go to heaven. So I believe uh, the, uh, up to the age of accountability, children go to heaven. After that, 
then you have to make the decision. I don't know what that age is of accountability. Uh, some say seven, some say 12, we, some say, uh, we don't know for sure. Wow, but wow, really children good are not stuff. There. Okay, so no, you didn't see any children in your vision. No. Um, I, I believe that as well. I don't believe that the children go to hell. I believe that there's an age of accountability. Of course, we don't know. Maybe each kid depends, but right. I, I completely agree with that. Here's another one that got asked many times. They were wondering, Sheol, Hades, hell, are these all the same or is there a difference in these different places? Good question. Uh, well, first of all, the word Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell okay. and Hades is the Greek word for the current hell. So just Hebrew and Greek. Uh, the word Gehenna, Jesus used, he used the word hell, but if you look it up in the original, it's the word Gehenna. And that was, he used the word hell for Sheol four times, but he used 11 times, he used the word Gehenna. And that refers to the lake of fire, the future hell. So there's basically two hells, the current hell down deep in the earth. And then at judgment day in Revelation 20, 12 through 15, death and hell or Sheol will be delivered up or Hades will be delivered up and cast into the lake of fire. So they're basically two hells and Gehenna is the referring to the future hell, the lake of fire. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Really good stuff. Here was a, here's one that came in again. A lot of times, what about outer darkness? How can there be fire and outer darkness coexisting together there? That's a really good question, you know, but you know, there's the scientists have discovered black holes and where it's so dark, it consumes the light. It sucks in the light. Mm. So uh, it's possible to have a fire that would not produce light because of the intense gravitational pull or whatever God uses that causes that. So, you know, there's unusual things like the burning bush that Moses saw. Uh, it was burning, but it was not consumed. So, uh, you know, God somehow has a way that there can be fire and darkness at the same time. Wow. So just like when he had the plague of Egypt, he had fire and ice, you know, so he could mix the two. And uh, I'm sure he has no trouble with figuring out how to do that. And but I did see the flames. And uh, but it, again, it's so dark, it consumed them. It wasn't like bright, like it would be on the earth. It was like pulling in the light. Wow. And I want to just say too something to reiterate to the chat. You guys have to realize the stuff he saw and is describing a lot of the stuff. There's no English word to try to describe some of the stuff and the tours, the terrors of hell. Like if I said, can you describe how bad it was in, in words? You'd say there's no words to describe how actually how absolutely terrible hell is just like there's no smell to describe what hell smelled like. So when you, when he's describing things, I want you guys to also remember we're trying to describe things that are in your finite mind when you're talking about a an eternal realm this is a whole nother world that's not limited to what we finite understand like well tell me how this could be possible these things could be possible because it's not the same as a finite world we live in the fire is much different the darkness i know i think you said this as well you can feel the darkness it's something that's almost like it's almost like an entity the darkness is almost like a person to where you can literally feel you know the darkness in hell and you know, Isaiah, in um, Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, depart from me, cursed, into everlasting fire prepared. So not only is hell prepared, but the fire is prepared. So somehow he prepared that fire to be maybe dark but and consume, uh, to burn, but not consume. Wow. So, you know. Here's one that's interesting. And a lot of these questions, I'm loving them because I wanted, I would want to ask you these personally. So they're just, we're getting a two for one here, but here's one that got asked a lot of times was, could you tell time in hell? Like, was there some type of concept of it's this time? I mean, obviously it wasn't the time of the day, but is there any concept of time while you were there? Yes. I, I felt like I was there. I felt like I was there 23 weeks. Wow. I, I can't explain. Uh, every second seems to go by slow, maybe because of the pain, the, uh, everything you're going through. But yes, I had the understanding of the passage of time. And that's why I could grasp that time never ends. You never escape it. See, it's not just like uh, there is no time. It's, it's a passing thing. It just never ends. So yes, I could grasp it. I had that understanding. You know, and even in uh, heaven, it talks about there'll be silence Never for the ends. space of a half an hour. So it indicates their time. Uh, he said they'll be tormented in hell day and night forever and ever. Remember, uh, Isaiah, uh, Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that indicates there is a passage of time in hell. 
Wow. Guys, we just lost um, just for that one, like, 10 seconds. We dropped off of Facebook, but we're back on now. So it was about 10 seconds we lost there, but we're back on. So if you're on Facebook, just refresh it. You'll come right back. I looked at my stats here, and uh, Facebook had a server issue, so it was on their end, but they're restoring it right now. Um, here was one that I wanted to... Let me see. Um, man, I had one that I wanted to ask you here. Oh, could God pull people out of hell if they die, or once you're in hell, it's too late to come out? No, it's too late. I mean, its decision is permanent. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these should go in everlasting life and these should go in everlasting punishment. Mm -hmm. He used the word there, everlasting is the word Ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. And the same thing in John 5, 29, Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15. I'll talk about it being one place or the other. There's no being let out. You're there permanently. You'll never escape. Wow. And, and that's why it's so important. That's what Jesus saved us from, uh, eternal hell. So you're not going to get out. Again, if you got out, that would be works, you know? Yeah. He let, and he's not going to let you out for works because none of us, our works are filthy rags to God. Amen. And here's one that people were asking too. I don't know. I, I don't know if you mentioned this. How did you know that you, if you guys don't know, the book's called 23 Minutes in Hell. That's the title of the book, the title of our stream tonight. How did you know that you were there for 23 minutes? Well, I got up at three o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water. And that's when I was pulled out of my body. And when I returned and I saw my body lying on the floor, I entered back in, the Lord left. And, you know, when I traveled back with him, perfect love casts out fear. I had no fear whatsoever. But when he left, the memories of hell flooded back into my mind. And when I entered my body, I started screaming and I went into a traumatized state. My screams woke up my wife. And the first thing she did is look at our digital clock and it read 323. So that's where the 23 comes from. Wow, really, really good. Um, here is one. If you are if you were in hell and you're an atheist or a non-believer, did, did they finally know the truth? Did they, someone said, did the atheist finally know the truth? Like, did you know once you get to hell, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Or are you ignorant of that fact? I think you would know. Um, I wasn't maybe there long enough to really think about all that. I was just in such torment and terror. I was just trying to think of, you know, there's no way to escape this. And, you know, it'd be like if someone was chasing you in a dark alley with a big knife. And for those moments, you wouldn't think about much other than escaping. And so my mind was only on, how do I get out? I can't get out. Uh, this is horrible. Why am I here? All those thoughts. But I didn't really give it a thought about Jesus being the only way. But, you know, the rich man in hell, he did know that his brothers needed to repent. So he was aware of that. So I'm sure oh, eventually wow. would have, I would have known that. That's interesting, but, guys. Think about what he just said right there. The rich man knew, was in hell, was obviously in hell because he wasn't a believer, but he was in hell and he knew his brothers needed to repent. So that's interesting because that shows us that people in hell, even though they're there, know that there's a way. And I think David Wilkerson had a famous sermon on hell where he talked about in hell reliving all your memories of being in church service because most people even those that are in hell have been to church here or there one time in their life or maybe they were raised in church or whatever and it's such a tormenting thought bill that you could be in hell remembering all these altar calls these services and then wishing you can go back and this is why tonight guys there's 4400 of you i want you to just listen to me soberly right now this could be and i'm not this is not scare tactic it's reality this could be the last message that you ever hear like we're in all all of us are inches away from eternity and who's to say that this isn't the last message you've ever heard and it would be such a tormenting thing to be in hell and be hearing this live stream over and over again for eternity remembering i was in that i was i had that opportunity to say yes to christ to give my life to jesus and i didn't take that opportunity so that's a very sobering thought to think you know this could be one of the last messages people ever hear you know isaiah just a quick story you know yeah. my neighbor that uh, i knew for years he was a tough marine atheist he did not want to hear about god i tried to tell him over the years year after year and he just mocked god laughed at it he was tough as nails and we had one day i found out he was in the hospital dying i didn't know what of but i asked his wife can i go see him and she says yes but don't talk to him about the bible he does not want to hear about the bible well, my wife and I went to see him and he had tears coming down his face when we walked in and he looked like skin and bones from being this big, strong guy. And um, he said, Bill, I was terrified last night. And I said, why? And he goes, I was dying. I was slipping out of my body and I was going down this long, dark tunnel wow. and it was getting hotter and darker. And I, I've never been scared of anything. 
He said, but I knew I was headed to hell. I was terrified and he had tears running down his face. He said, please tell me, what does it mean to be saved? How do I get saved? Wow. And this is a tough guy. And so we told him all about salvation, explained he needed to repent of his sins, that God loved him and gave his life for him on the cross, explained all that. And he says, please let me say that prayer. And he did. And all of a sudden, even the wrinkles seemed to leave. And then now he had tears of joy. And he said, and I said, you don't have to fear anymore. You're not going to go to hell. You're going to go to heaven. But here's a guy that wouldn't listen until he was on his way. So God had mercy on him, uh, giving him a glimpse. But that doesn't happen for everybody. You know, you can, you can die in a second. We spoke at a church and a young guy came. He was 23 years old. And he said, I don't believe you, Bill Weiss. I don't believe any of that. And his best friend went out to uh, breakfast with him the next day and said, look, you're my best friend. I want you to go to heaven with me. He goes, I don't want to hear any of that Bible stuff. I'm not interested in any of that. That's a bunch of foolishness. And he said, look, you're my buddy. I want you to go to heaven. He said, don't talk to me about it. I don't want to hear it. And he got up from the table. It's a true story. He got up from the table. Five minutes later, his car hit a brick wall and he died. Oh. Now, his friend thought, man, my friend, if he didn't change in the last five minutes, he'll be in hell forever. And he'd had that time to think about, wow, I heard the gospel. Yeah. I had the opportunity. And now he's got an eternity to regret his foolish decision. You know, so I, I, people cannot make this mistake. You know, hell is permanent. And one second after you die, it's too late. You'll never get another chance. So please investigate the scriptures for yourself. People that are listening, you do not want to go to this place. You will not get out. And it, what Jesus said is all true. Hell is real. But because he loves us, he gives us a free will to choose. It's not his decision. It's ours. Wow, so good. Here's one that we can't, you know, we can't escape this question. Of course, everyone, this is the number one most asked question. I'm sure you've answered this question thousands of times. How could a loving God, you're like, I already know where you're going with this. How could a loving God send people to hell? Wouldn't God sending people to hell automatically make God unloving? Well, remember, it's the same God that died a horrible death to keep you out. So how is that unloving? That's the most loving act you can do is give your life. So, but and number two, like I said, it's not his decision. He left that up to us. And Jesus said in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the father, but by me. So he said he was the only way to heaven. So if a person says, you know, Bill, I don't believe that. Well, there's a verse for you in Revelation 21, eight, it says all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So he just told you, if you don't believe Jesus is the only way, that's the warning. You'll end up in the lake of fire. Now, that's why you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe Jesus is the only way. You send yourself to hell. He's not sending anybody. He's given you the free will to choose, but he can't force you into the decision. He's told you ahead of time, there's a trial coming in heaven, a trial date, and he's, and we're going to all stand before God and, and you're going to have to pay for your own sins if you don't receive Jesus, because he pays for our sins, but you have to receive him as your Lord and Savior. So he's telling you ahead of time what's going to take place at the trial to now repent and receive Jesus so you won't have to pay for your own sins and end up in hell. God makes it clear. He gives us a free will to choose. You know, people, people don't like it that there's consequences for our decisions. Wow. Someone asked, Bill, were you traumatized after this event? And did you ever meet, have you ever met anyone else in, that has had a similar experience um, as you, what you had? I was traumatized at the moment until my wife prayed. I screamed out, pray for me, pray for me. The Lord has taken me to hell. And God suddenly removed the horror, left the memory, but took the horror away. So he can divide both soul and spirit. So somehow he did that. And I had no trauma, no nightmares, nothing like that. I just had the passion to want to witness. And so, um, but yes, I've met many other people that have also had a vision of hell. Uh, some near-death experience of people that were on their deathbed, uh, that were atheists. I've also met people that were Christians that God gave a vision of heaven or hell. Uh, one is John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, one of the most famous books. He wrote a book called Visions of Heaven and Hell. And he's considered a real credible guy by the scholars. Uh, but there's many, many books. I, I'm just one of the many uh, that have actually seen hell. So, you and know, and Acts 2.17, God said in the last days, he'll give your young men visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So he's just fulfilling the scripture by giving people dreams and visions. And he can show you heaven or hell or whatever he like. And this was his own sovereign will. I would never ask to see hell. 
you know, I'd rather see heaven anyway. Yeah, and I would I want to remind you guys too that Paul actually saw heaven. He said 14 years ago, out of the body or in the body, I don't know, but I was I was saw paradise and it couldn't can't basically said it couldn't speak of it. So it ta it let us know according to scripture, it's possible for God to show you heaven. If God can show you heaven, of course God can show you hell. God and God can do whatever He wants. So I think for the people that say, well, why God can't and you can't? God can do anything. All things are possible and we see out of body experiences trances visions dreams that had stuff like this in all throughout scripture all throughout the bible god was get, showing people things through vision so i definitely right. don't think it's out of the realm possibility and, for those that are and jonah 2 2 he said in hell i cried out and jonah 2 6 the earth with her bars was about me forever so jonah is someone that actually saw hell mm -hmm. uh now it wasn't a vision uh he was actually whether he died or not we don't know but he's somebody in the bible that did see hell Wow, really good. So here's one. Christians are very narrow-minded. Isn't there more than one way to heaven? Well, first of all, Jesus said he was the only way in John 14, 6. That's number one. Come he on. said he was the only way. But also, you know, uh, most of the world religions are based on philosophical thought, except for four. Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Mm -hmm. These four are based on personalities. But only Christianity claims resurrection for its founder. That makes Christianity unique because no other religious leader died for your sins and then rose from the dead. Jesus died for our sins. He claimed that he did. He rose from the dead and there's much proof of the empty tomb. So that makes Christianity unique and only one way. So that's And, and I love the analogy that you used. I've heard you use this before and I, I think you, I might have it in your book yes. or I, I have your other book on the questions on hell, but you talk about if I was telling you how to get to my house, right. tell, tell us about that analogy real quick. Right, that was an analogy God gave me. You know, if you invited me over to dinner to your home and you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you come to my house. And But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. Well, you're going to say to me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. The same way God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. All we have to do is follow his clear directions. We will get there. That's not narrow minded. That's specific. He's given us specific clear directions on how to get to his house. So good. I think you guys should use that when you're ministering, witnessing to people. I've used that before and people are like, wow, I never thought of it that way. And so it's a really good, it's a really good analogy that you guys can use while you're sharing about hell and about heaven, about salvation. Um, right. Here's go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say the back up another point where you asked me earlier about good, you know, can good get you to heaven? And none of us are good, but you know, an analogy helps people understand that too. First of all, we're not good according to God's standard. James 2.10 said, we defend his law at one point, uh, we've broken his law. Just one thing, if we lie once, steal one thing, have one lustful thought, uh, that's the same as committing adultery and no adulterer will inherit heaven. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24.9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin one foolish thought would exclude us from heaven wow. so that's a pretty high standard so none of us can stand before holy god and say i'm pretty good let me in job 15 16 says man so filthy he drinks iniquity like water but the second reason good will not get you to heaven is and this analogy might help you know if you went and found the most expensive home in the country knocked on their door and said oh, excuse me i'm moving in with you because i'm a good person what do you think the people would say no, right? You wouldn't expect them to let you in. You don't know them. I said, but people go through their whole life. They have nothing to do with God. They deny Jesus as the son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of their life, they have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because they're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You see, he offered to be your uh, f father throughout your whole life, but you pushed him away. People push him away. They say, no, I don't want you to be my father. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, Romans 9, 7 and 8, John 17, 9, Ephesians 5, 1, all explain that he's your creator. He's not your father to you. You invite him in. So that's unreasonable to expect to live at someone's house you don't even know. Wow, so that's such a good analogy. So good. Um, here's a question that came in a bunch too. Is preaching hell a scare tactic? And I know a lot of pastors and leaders that are watching. There's 4,500 people on here. I know some of you pastors, you've been wanting. I've had pastors write me say, I want to talk about hell, but isn't it a scare tactic? And and again, I, I, know, I know what I want to say, but I want to know what is your take on that? Well, you know, hell should scare any rational person, number one. And Jude 23 said, some are saved through fear, pulling them out of yes. the fire. 
that's number one. But number two, it's actually not a fear message because it's a message of love because it's a message of warning. You know, I think about 10 years ago when we saw Hurricane Ike hit the Gulf Coast, uh, the front page of a Texas newspaper and CNN said, certain death to those who don't vacate. Now, you wouldn't say the writers of that article were mean for issuing that statement. No, you'd be grateful for the, for the warning. Well, the same way God's given us a clear warning, there really is a hell. That's a loving message. You know, if he didn't tell us, then you wouldn't know. So he's telling you ahead of time, hey, there's a real hell. It's worse than you can imagine. I don't want you to go there, but I'm giving you the free will to choose. That's a message of love. But it should scare any rational person. If you understand how severe it is, yeah, you, if you can get saved that way, that's fine. You, or get saved through God's goodness, whatever it takes, just don't deny Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yeah, and I think it takes everyone, it takes something different to reach them. I, I remember when I was an atheist, I had never had a believer tell me I was going to hell. I legitimately was raised in church, decided, I don't even think I was an atheist. I think I was more of an agnostic, like, oh, I don't believe God. God's not real. He doesn't care. I wish a Christian would have warned me of hell. I wish they would have told me, Isaiah, your actions are leading you to hell because for me, Bill, if you would have said, oh, well, God loves you, I would have said, I love me. I didn't care. I didn't care that God loved me. I was arrogant. I was prideful. I was everything you could think of. I needed someone to warn me. So some of you might have said, the first thing God told me when he saved me was how much he loved me. And it was the love of God that brought me. But that's not everybody. That might be your story. But there's a lot of hard hearted people out there. They need to hear about hell to scare them into it. And I know you say we don't say it like that. That's the reality. This is something that is shocking and should bring people to realize this is not a game this is not a joke this is a real place and so i agree 100 percent with you yeah i mean it's just like if you if a person says well yeah uh receive jesus as your lord and savior and i think well, well i don't what do i need to receive him for i'm not interested they're not told because if you don't you're going to yes. end up in this horrible place you know and john the baptist the uh, first thing he said was to repent and he said who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come he told the pharisee so there's a wrath coming on sin. He's talking about hell and burning. So that's what he first started off saying, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So, you know, letting us know that you need to repent and um, flee from this wrath and hell's a real place.